you're welcome once again. This is Invest in GH. Invest in GH is the leading provider of financial news and education in Ghana. Over the years, our news, magazines, and webinars have been delivered to thousands of people in Ghana and beyond. We'd like to thank you all for continuing to support our brand and for joining us for today's webinar. This is the ninth webinar in our series and the first for this year, 2021. I know it's been a tough couple of months for us with the pandemic and everything going on, but we are happy that we can meet here to discuss a few things. We've had webinars that have talked about investments in mutual funds, stocks, cryptocurrencies, and real estate. All our previous webinars are available to stream on our YouTube channel, Invest in GH. This webinar is also streaming live on our YouTube channel, Invest in GH. So if you're unable to join us here, or you know someone who is unable to join us via the Zoom link that has been provided, kindly copy the YouTube live link, which has been made available in the chat section to the person. Today's topic is how to build wealth, assets and strategies. And to take us through this discussion, we have a very wealthy and high profile speaker in the person of Dr. Ohene Aku Papon. I'll be calling him Oak throughout this webinar. He's our speaker for today. And I would like us all to welcome him. But before he comes to speak to us, let me give you a brief introduction of who he is. Dr. Kwapon is the founder of the Songhai Group, a corporate development company. He is also a board member of Park Street Nordicom in Denmark and a board member of Ecobank Ghana as well. He has over 30 years of experience in the investment banking industry, having served as Chief Operating Officer EMEA Asia Credit Trading and Structured Markets at the Royal Bank of Scotland. He has also held senior management positions, vice president, senior vice president positions at the New York City Economic Development Corporation, Deutsche Bank, GE Capital, and Microsoft over the years. Oak holds a PhD in nonlinear systems engineering from Columbia University and an MBA in financial engineering from MIT Sloan School of Management. He has also received an undergraduate degree in graduate degrees from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We will begin our session with a presentation from Oak, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, Oak, are you around? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Let me uh, turn on okay. my video. Uh, All right. You can see me now, right? Thank you for joining us today. Oh, okay. We, we can hear you, but you sound a bit um, far away from yours. Oh, I sound, uh, uh, is, it, is it better? Yeah, it's, it's a bit better now. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, thank you for joining us today. We are happy to have you here with us. Okay, uh, uh, I'm most welcome also. Okay, so um, I'll leave you to have your presentation and then... Oh, okay. When you are done, we would have a Q&A session and then discuss. Okay. Uh, let me actually, uh, hold on, let me share my screen. Uh, and then I think, uh, uh, let me actually do a couple of things here before we start. Uh, okay. So I think uh, we're, we're probably ready to start. Let me bring up the presentation. Uh, okay. Minimize this. Okay, so let me put this in the presentation mode and then uh, at some point, you know, uh, uh, we, we can, so, so uh, I, I guess we can start, right, Prince? Yes, yes, you can. Oh, okay. you can. All right. So what I want to do is I want this to be a discussion uh, because, you know, uh, I'm, I'm of the opinion that, uh, you know, things like going to financial planning classes, budgeting, all that stuff, you know, it ends up wasting a lot of time. 
right? When really you want to build wealth, right? Uh, and the reason why I had the audience actually read the book Against the Gods, uh, it's very, very personal, uh, experiential book to me. Uh, not only do I know the author, but also uh, I remember when I first got my first job uh, at uh, Deutsche Bank, you know, uh, my first year I was asked to actually sell bonds to JP Morgan. And obviously, you know, you've taken classes, you feel like, okay, you have your license, okay, I'm back, I'm in, you know, investment banking, I'm supposed to sell a billion dollars bonds to JP Morgan, I'm going to pick up a phone, look at my Bloomberg terminal. Uh, and, and I was very, very jazzed up about it. The problem is, after I did it, my boss called me about five hours later, into a room with uh, other, other folks, and basically said, dude, you just lost a hundred. We just lost one hundred and sixty million dollars, and that was the trade that I did, and I lost money on it. It was very big money. I thought I was going to be fired, but that was the first time my boss looked at me and says, "Well, welcome. Now you understand what risk is, right?" And if you read that book, what you notice is sketched out in the book is this whole idea about being in a certain framework that nobody gets wealthy or builds capital by staying at home. And we'll get into that more. Uh, you know, all these stories that are sketched out in the book are people who really, really braced the oceans, they took risk, went behind their, their, their extremities and basically moved on and achieved greater things. And in the process, were able to build a lot of uh, wealth and capital. You know, and that's no different from a country. You know, it, what happens is that if you have a country, the only way you develop as a country is you have to go outside and you have to solve what I'll call your extreme problems, right? If you solve your extreme problems, guess what? You move forward. And it's the same way. And so as a discussion that I want us to get into really about building wealth, I think I want to do it a little different, but really shaking us up and having a discussion about what I'm going to share with you, right? Okay, so let's establish a perspective here, right? Can, can, can you see the screen pretty well? Prince, can you guys see the yes, screen? Yes, yes, I can, I can. Okay, beautiful. All right, so let's establish a perspective here. So uh, this is a pyramid worldwide of the whole population in the world in 2015, right? Everybody that has less than $10,000 in wealth is sitting here over about 4 billion people right now, right? So this is everybody with about $10,000 in wealth. That is everybody. And it's about 4 billion people. The world right now is about 7 billion people, right? So 2015, we had about almost about 71% of everyone less than $10,000. And then everyone between 10,000 and 100,000 is another billion and a half now, right? In 2020. And then you have 349 million here and you have 34 million people who actually have more than $1 million in wealth. And this is basically including assets, your liquid assets, cash in the bank, plus your assets that you hold, right? So obviously, this is the nature of the world. And when everyone is born, you basically are starting from down here, right? Forget about whatever money your parents have given to you. You're going to start from down here. And we're going to talk about that. So the question is, here is the pyramid, the perspective that we have. How do we go from here? If you're here, how do you go and migrate towards here, right? You know, this thing here, this picture was actually shared with me probably in 2001. It was shared with me. That was when I had actually left Deutsche Bank to go to Microsoft. And this picture was shared with me. It was shared actually with me by a Wells Fargo Bank private uh, client services because they were trying to get me as a customer and showed me basically what they could help me do, 
right, to migrate up, right? So this is a perspective that I want you to get. And the question that I want to throw to you is that if we are actually in the, in the in sort of starting our career and building our career, working and whatnot, how we, do we actually build our assets and move up such that generationally, you know, when we are dead and gone, we are able to sustain and actually pass on something that migrates here, right? Whether you like it or not, most developing countries are here, right? Most of, as a group. So the thing is actually advanced countries have dominated he, uh, up here. So we're going to look at some ideas and concepts that I honestly believe that as an individual, if you actually get yourself immersed in it and take advantage of it, then you can really, really see yourself uh, building worth. Now, as I go on, because I want to make it a discussion, if you have uh, a question, please throw it to Prince and have Prince, uh, you know, pop in and ask the question so we can, you know, get to it, right? Okay. So, again, setting the perspective, this is the high net worth individuals in the world. So, from 2012 to about 2019, right? So this came out actually in 2020. So if you look at this, the number of high net worth individuals, you've got about 6.5 million in Asia, 6.3 in North America, basically Canada and the US, 5.2 million in, the, in uh, Europe, and about 0.8 in Middle East, 0.6, in Latin America and point two in Africa, right? So obviously some of the concepts that we're going to look at for the individual, we have to figure out how do we get ourselves and give our, 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 our generations that are coming a chance to basically all increase this bucket here, right? So this is, this is, this is reality, right? Today in the world that we live in. If you even break it down further by countries, this is how it looks like, right? So the population of high net wealth individuals, basically that have more than about $5 million in wealth are basically like this, right? So Indonesia has about 3%, US have about 11%. And this, this is nothing but the world of developed countries and countries that have solved a lot of problems, right? So if you take individuals, even Africans who are in the US, they are all being counted here, right? So this is the reality that we, we have in, in, the, in the, the basically the environment through which we have to figure out how to build our own wealth, right? Uh, and if I were to break it down even further, look at this, this is people with, five million to 30 million dollars right in wealth and you have what thousand seven hundred and fifty seven you know in, right basically it's like 1.7 million people out of basically seven billion people right now you know uh Luckily enough, you know, I guess I, 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 I had a chance to actually learn quite a bit when I was in investment banking, such that I could actually say, okay, I've actually built myself where, you know, I get counted here, right? But there are certain things I want to share with you that helped me and allowed me to do that, right? Mm -hmm. The first thing that I want you to think about is this, and this is the reality that I want each person that's listening to this presentation to actually have in, in mind. There are four things that you should know about what I call your financial life, right? Now, the first question that you should know is that what is your net worth today? Do you actually have a good sense of what you own and what you owe, right? And number two, if you were actually going to retire today from work, could you do it? If you said, okay, I don't want to work anymore, I want to retire, can you actually do it? Number three, where is your money and capital invested? And then number four, 
what will happen if, right? And what will happen if really is a several different questions. This is where the, the whole idea of risk and, and, and sort of risk management comes in. What will happen if you were to actually get sick today? What will happen if you were to get into a car accident and be disabled? What will happen if you were to lose your house? What will happen if you were to lose your job? What will happen if you were hit with a lawsuit? What will happen if everything got destroyed, right? These, these four questions are what I, I believe that in every instant and every time, wherever stage you are in life, you really have to have a very sharp sense of it, right? Six reasons why people fail financially, right? A, a few people get a really good sense of time and what it means as far as building capital and building wealth. Often at times, people do not establish any objective. You know, you go to work, you get a job, you get paid, you come home, you buy a stereo system, you buy, you get an apartment, you get whatever. The question is, what is the objective of all this? What are you trying to do? When you work, where is it that you're trying to get to, right? Do you really are very educated about money? Do you really understand what money can do? Do you really understand how money even works, right? Number four, this whole idea, what I'll call chaotic social organization, and we'll touch on that. So if you really do not understand what is happening in society around you and how you take advantage with it, or how you actually manage yourself in terms of the risk, then do you even know how much value is destroying in your life, right? Failure to prepare, prepare for the unexpected, you know, a death, this car accident, this or that, right? And then the lastly is basically your own attitude towards finances, right? which is something that we all take for granted. Everybody thinks they know how they, to, to, to spend their own money, which is of course, the question is, do you know how much my, your money is being destroyed? You know, do you have a very good attitude and very good sense of money, right? So now let's level set. The world that we are living in, we are living in, in a world where it's dominated by one currency, the US dollar. And whether we like it or not, if, if you're in Ghana and earning money in cities, earning money, paying stuff in cities, buying stuff in cities, you know, I got to tell you, you know, uh, I left Ghana in 1981. When I was leaving Ghana in 1981, my dad had opened a bank account for me at Barclays. And uh, he had actually put quite a bit of money in it for me. The day that I graduated in the US and went to the bank to check, when I went there, I'll tell you what was left could not even buy uh, a carton of beer in Ghana. And this was like in 2000 and about, about 1998, I actually went to check on it. You know, and, and basically the, 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 the worth of it had been destroyed over the years. You know, not only had they gone through several devaluations by different governments and you no know, re-denominations and whatnot, it was just destroyed. What do you think will happen if my dad actually had opened the account and actually somehow saved money in dollars, right? If it was in dollars, guess what? I'll be much, much, much in a, a better place, place, right? So this is the world we live in. So. Whilst uh, when it comes to the whole concept of being aware and understanding how money works and what basically the environment and really being astute to risk, it's, it's really a very, very significant piece of it because look at this. Since 2008 to 2020, there are several countries, you know, you've got Singapore here, you've got South Africa, you've got Asia, uh, Rwanda, all of them, their currencies have somehow managed to be a bit more stable. And this is the city, right? This is the Ghana city. 
So since 2008, this is what the CD has done, right? So this is the incredible devaluation of the city. Just be, it just is depreciation over time. So obviously, if you're trying to build wealth and you're trying to build capital in Ghana, in, in cities, you obviously have a much less potent city today. Basically, your, your wealth would have been destroyed. You will actually have to make enough money to make up for the difference for this basically depreciating asset that you basically are earning your, 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 your living in, right? So that is what I want you to have in mind as we go through the type of assets you want to think about and all that stuff, right? Okay, so now let's get into a discussion here. Uh, I showed you the wealth triangle, right? where you have different stages. So here is everyone with $10,000 in net worth. 5 million to 30 million is over here. And then 30 million plus, which is made up of about 34 million people. Right? So this is the wealth pyramid. So now think about it. I'm going to put this line here. When we are born, when you're here, right? You're going to basically try and figure out how to move up like this, right? So the first thing that we have to think about is basically the duration of our life, right? So think about it this way. Here is this line. This is the return that you have to basically make throughout life in order for you to actually be able to get along. So let's just put 8% here. So now think about this. When you're born, you're basically going to do this. You're going to do this. And you're going to come like that, right? So let's say what this is uh, uh, optimum age, right? So when you're born up to about say 20 years, you'll be in school. So whilst you're in school, you're earning less than, whilst you're in school, let me go back. Whilst you're in school, you're learning less than the return that you need to basically create capital and build wealth, right? So here, somebody else is paying for you to enjoy life and steady, right? There will come a time you have to figure out the job that's going to do this for you. And from here, all this is the time that you need to. So let me put this here as the, your retirement age, right? So let's put 60 years here. So from about 20 years to 60 years, you need to earn enough money such that when you go into retirement, somebody else is not going to provide for you, but rather you're going to do this. You're going to do this and you're going to have enough money to still enjoy the life that you had when you are here. So the trick right now is basically how do you really plan your financial life such that this part here is maximized and you can actually have what I call the flexibility, the financial flexibility that you want in life such that you can basically enjoy 
and do the things that you're passionate about and love, right? So this piece here is what is critical. We are all given a, a chance to go and study and study, but once you study and you get a job, if you're not able to figure out this, then what is going to happen is this, right? And basically you will always be catered for. So this is where we want to be, right? And build enough capital such that when we retire, we are actually still living the life that we want to live, right? The challenge though is this, when you start working, when you start working, approximately you have 10 years, 10 years to set your earnings power for the rest of your life. Meaning that before 10 years, if you do not achieve a certain earning power, that is it. After 10 years, nobody is going to pay you more than more than basically they believe that you can give them. Here, be, below 10 years, this is where people are willing to pay you with potential in mind, thinking about what you can do and be willing to pay you more than a return that is basically more compensates for what you're putting in, right? So if you fail to increase your earning potential, when you start working the first 10 years, it becomes even harder, right? Now, the question is, if I were to flip your, your working life on its side and actually go like that, right? So obviously this, this here is going to be the maximum point where you are earning quite a lot of money, right? And I'll tell you, let me share with you my example and how some of these things I figured out before I went into banking. So I started my career with Exxon, right? So here I started with Exxon and then I was sent to Houston to basically manage a plant there. One day there was a guy called Nino Ferno who was retiring. So. I got with Nino over lunch and I asked him that that time I was probably making about thousand about $120,000 a year. That is how much I was making way back there, $120,000 a year. Now I remember getting with Nino Fano and I asked him, Nino, let me ask you, I just started working for Exxon. I've been with Exxon about three years. You're about to retire. You've been with Exxon about 30 years. Could you share something with me? And he asked me what. So this guy has a PhD. And I asked him how much he was making. And he told me he was making $140,000 a year. As soon as I heard that, I was very, very quiet. I walked straight to my boss's office, Alan Chan. And I said, Alan, I just spoke to Nino. He's retiring and he's been at Exxon for 30 years. He's making 140000 I'm making 120,000. So are you telling me that it's gonna take me another 15 years to make $20,000 more? I said, heck no. And I just told him I'm resigning. And I just gave them my, re my resignation date and I applied to Sloan School of Management, got accepted to Sloan and went and basically spent two years figuring out what I want to do next. When I came out, my first job, which I got with Deutsche Bank, my starting salary was $340,000 a year. So if you could imagine, if I had stayed with Exxon without really being very concerned about my earning potential, 
it would have basically, I would have done something like this. It would have peaked here and it would have done this, done this and done this. But because of the change that I made, because I needed to increase, I was just shocked. I was able to move this thing here and push it much further here. Well, the question is, how then do you, how do you figure out that? How, do you, how did I figure out that in order to get to this point, right? And this is where basically the whole idea of thinking about what I'll call social organization is very critical. If you move with people who are very financially literate, you will be financially literate. If you move with people who are very disciplined, you will be disciplined. What it is is that when we all start our career down here, it's chaos. Your friends, you're moving around, different people, whatnot, you're spending money on clothing, you're doing all kinds of stuff, right? But what happens is that you just have to figure out the right lane or the right group of people to then begin. So for me, the experience at Exxon came when I actually met a guy whose father was actually a managing director at Goldman Sachs. So this guy that I met, Colin, in New York, became a very good friend of mine. His father was at Goldman Sachs, a managing director, and I was an employee at Exxon. That is how I got that passion and love for the markets because we went to visit him one time over Thanksgiving and I learned a whole lot. I learned a whole lot. I used to basically walk into this man's house and imagine just how he was able to achieve what he had. And he was such a good man that he will sit and basically speak with you about a lot of things, right? So now, we're going to go into a moment where I'm going to share with you a bit about how folks in the investment banking world think about creating wealth so that you can get a sense of how you basically want to also plan your life. Now, here I've been using the word net worth a lot. It's nothing but what you owe, what, what you own and what you owe, right? In the end, you want to get to a point where what you own, right, are earning assets. Meaning that there's no point building three homes in Ghana, three houses in Ghana, so you can be a house owner or you can be a guy who has homes. That doesn't make sense, right? What it is, is if you're going to build anything, if you're going to own anything, you want to get to a point wh where they are all earning assets, meaning that they have recurring revenue that they're bringing to you. And liabilities, you want to get to a point where you're, you're basically using other people's money efficiently, right? So that's where you, you basically want to get to. If you can't use other people's money efficiently, then you basically have to fund it yourself, right? So that's it. If you do that, then the whole idea is basically to maximize this, right? There are several different assets that you can sort of use to do, to basically increase this and minimize this, right? And I'll, I'll actually, I'll come back to this, but let me actually uh, go over a few things uh, first. In fact, actually, let me do this. Uh, okay. Let me add a, uh, okay. All right, cool, all right. Okay. Let me do this. So one of the things that uh, I want to share with you this afternoon that's very critical is basically how you think about uh, your finance, the financial world, assets, and all these stuff, right? You know, you, everyone knows there is something called interest rates, right? So interest rate 
it's just basically simple return on assets that are out there, right? But one of the things that I want you to think about is this. If this is today, and this is say 30 years from now, right? And this is 20 years, and this is 10 years. Interest rate, when you borrow money from a bank in Ghana, they will charge you a certain interest rate, right? When you buy something, your currencies, whatever you have, if you have a home in Ghana, guess what? That home, because it's sitting there as an asset, is also depreciating as a certain, in, a certain rate, right? So if you borrow money to buy it, then you have to make sure that sometime in future, if you want to sell it, you're able to sell it above the amount that you borrowed it and then cover all your depreciation and whatnot, right? So this interest rate, I want you to think about it. This is how in the bank, in the world of investment banking, we think about it and we use it to sort of invest and stuff, right? So there's the basic rate that is based on, in a sense, what I'll call the, the government the government curve, right? So if I take Ghana government, right, and all the treasuries and the bonds and stuff that they've issued, right, or any country, if I take US government, it will be the same thing, right? This will be basically the government curve, right? And this government curve here is a certain interest rate. So in Ghana right now, be like, uh, you know, 17%, you know, uh, starting with 15% in the US right now, be like about 0.5% and whatnot, right? By looking into the future, you have this curve, right? And that curve is something that you have to pay attention to and you actually have to understand to be financial literate, you have to really be able to understand how this curve is moving around over time, right? And we'll get into some of the ways to, to, to look at it. On top of this curve, you have another curve here that is called the credit curve, right? So this credit curve here comes in different levels. So this is where companies basically, so if you think about it, this is where government, basically this level here is where government funds itself, right? This level here is where companies fund themselves. And then you have another level here right, where basically, let me just call it the default curve. So default curve is where different financial products that people are trying to use to make money ends up being, right? Now, in the world of investment banking, knowing how these move around then allows you to select which assets to actually put your money into today, which sectors to put your money into today, which companies to bet on and whatnot, right? And we're going to go into some graphs so that I can give you a bit more sense of being a bit more literate about this world of finance and how you think about what happens with your money and how you actually begin to uh, you know, uh, build some capital, right? Okay, so here, let's take a look at this. When we read, when I sent you the book Against the Gods, and you read it, you get a sense that people are willing to take risk to really get the return and be able to build what they are passionate about and whatnot. And the folks who basically took to the oceans, no one thought there was nothing behind the oceans, you know, but when they, they took to the oceans and they braved the world, uh, they braved the chaos, they were able to actually realize incredible dream, right? So think about this. Since 1996 to now 2020, this is literally how the world has been. So a lot of folks have not really taken time to think about this, but there have been a lot of dislocations in the world that often at times when we look at it, we think, oh, okay, this is news, it's happening in the US, it's happening in Europe. But you know what? 
every time these lo these locations happen, guess what? There's incredible period where people are building wealth. And the question is, are you going to participate in it or are you not going to participate in it? Because those cycles is what had created the, di the, the pyramid of wealth that I showed you at the beginning. 1999, there was a crash and then it comes down. 2002, it goes up again and then we had another crash and it comes down. And then we have the 2009 financial crisis and then now we've gone up and it's like the longest time we've gone up until we got here where basically the world got hit with pandemic, right? So people who actually are building the biggest wealth and really moving up are very, very much like the guys in the Against the Gods book. They know the surroundings, what happened, and every crisis becomes an opportunity to reorganize their life and do something that basically always propels them up, right? So think about it. Look at this graph here. This, you would think, is just a U.S. specific event. But guess what? Each of them has driven the world. Why? Because the dollar drives the world. You know, right now, if you take Ghana City, Ghana City right now looks very stable. And so when you, if you're sitting in Ghana, you think, okay, oh, wow, the city in Ghana is quite stable. The government has done well. It hasn't moved around. And now it looks like it's strengthening. Well, guess what? It, it's doing that because the, the dollar itself has been weakening. And the dollar, is, the dollar itself has not done anything. So the moment the dollar does something, you like it or not, the city is going to go one way or the other. That is the world we live in, right? And guess what? Whatever global crisis happened, that is why people are sharing around now saying that, you know, uh, the wealth of billionaires have increased about 3.7 trillion. And how come it was a pandemic and everybody else has lost jobs? And well, guess what? Because the guys at the top have incredible earning assets that are always sitting there and they are very much aware of this whole concept where whenever there is dislocation disruptions, that, that's the time that they also make money. You know, it's not uh, by fluke that you've seen so many companies come in public and so many what they call SPACs being done in the U.S., because it's the, it's the time that people are try, try, trying to take advantage of that, right? So crisis in 1999, collapse of the tech bubble. All we all remember, there was Yahoo, Yahoo Finance and everything, and, and they all collapsed. And then the global crisis. So every crisis, every crisis, every crisis, the market had gone up and up and up and up. But what it is, is even more, every crisis, individuals that are very financially aware and astute have been able to discover a way to basically increase their worth, right? Okay, so this, this is saying the same thing, right? And so actually, let me go over here. So this is all saying the same thing, right? Right? Now, the thing that, I want you guys to be very much aware is this, the 10 year treasury yields. So the US, because it dominates the world so much, right? The 10 year interest rate, the treasury yields for the US actually drives a lot of things in this world, right? And if you're going to be in Ghana and basically, build wealth. One of the things that I'll first say is this. Number one, find a way to have exposure to the US dollar itself and reduce your exposure in Ghana currency. Meaning that if you're actually being paid in Ghana in cities, then begin to put in place a way where you begin to actually start do some of your savings outside of city, right? Uh, and then pay attention to basically this US a 10-year treasury. That's very, very easy. Every time you go on 
uh, Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg or whatever, you will see what is being done and how people are talking about it, right? For example, this 10 year yields, think about this. This is gold, right? This is gold prices. You know, if you're sitting in Ghana, you've seen gold prices go up. So you're like, oh, wow, gold prices are up, man. We should all get into gold and you should all get in gold. Well, gold prices are up just because the 10 year yield is down. Why is the 10 year yield down? Well, because every time there's a crisis or there's, uh, you know, some kind of disruption, folks move to the 10 year yield and folks move to gold. That's the re simple reason. Gold is not driven by supply and demand and whatnot. So for example, if you were sitting in Ghana and you actually had put your money in gold, let's say at this point, you would have lost it because the 10 year would have come up. Now, now in the US, everyone is talking about this and when it's going to come up. The moment this start coming up, this is going to go down. So if you're someone who go and goes and put your money in gold right now, guess what? If the 10 year yield comes up, you, you're, you're, you're going to lose money, right? So this is sort of being a bit financially literate, right? Now, what do you do right now? So I don't know how many of you right now have sort of really set yourself up such that you have any assets that you're building up, right? So, uh, in fact, let me, so if I actually, let's see. So one of the things that I think I, I really advise everyone to think about is this. there's a core that you have to build, right? Meaning that you have to begin an asset base that you establish. And then you, you think about how you build this out and out and out and out and out, right? Your bank accounts are all in here, right? Your bank accounts are all in here. And then the rest is basically choices of assets and choices of stuff you want to use to basically grow that core, right? So for example, long time ago, I figured out that putting your money in banks, all of it, when you, whatever money you have and whatnot, actually is quite a, a useless, banks really don't, don't, don't do anything for you other than allowing you to pay people and whatnot. So long time ago, I advise people, use banks only for transactions. Nobody gets rich by going to a bank and opening a bank account and doing the savings at the bank. It doesn't happen. Nobody does it that gets rich. So you, number one, use banks only as a way to do your transactions, to facilitate your transactions, keep some money in there and whatnot, right? And then with what you were originally thinking of doing with banks, where you have money, I'll actually say, investment account, right? So this is where, if you're in Ghana, you go to a place like Data Bank, you open an investment account, you go to Fidelity. If you're in the US, you can go to Fidelity in the US, also the Fidelity equivalent in the US, right? And you actually open an investment account that has checking features, right? Because what happens is that it then begins to give you the flexibility to then think about how you deploy those assets, right? So never, this then becomes your base. This really becomes where you begin to build relationships and your financial literacy and whatnot. Don't ever use a bank to do this, right? And then the, of course, once you do this, then you basically can think about 
which how you then deploy it in different assets and whatnot, right? Okay, so now, obviously I do not know how many people have started really on the journey of saying, okay, how am I really going to build my wealth, my capital and get to a point where I am financially independent and I have financial flexibility, right? But just take a look at this graph. A person who began at the age of 25 and a person who began at the age of 35. So the guy who is, if you're young and you're thinking, okay, I'm still young and whatnot. Well, if you start at 25, by the time you're 65, this is the gap you're going to have. You're going to have a huge gap, right? So that's the, that's the gap that you're going to have. You see this huge gap? That's gonna be the gap you're going to have. So putting in, if you have savings of about say 10K and whatnot, and you did it today and you grew about 7.2% annually, you know, by the time you're 65, you have quite a, a lot of money. Now, here's the thing. The type of assets you put in is where it becomes the crust, right? So uh, we're going to actually, let me actually, okay. Oh, has this thing, it looks like this thing is frozen. Prince, how do I get out of this? Yeah, maybe you'd have to stop sharing and then reshare if it oh. wouldn't distract what you're already doing. Okay, let's see. Okay, let me reshare. Okay, all right. Oh, oh still. Okay. Is it better? Hold on, let's see. Let's see, I think, I think- Could also uh, be the application. And I think, I think it's probably the, uh, it's probably the, uh, I think it's the PowerPoint itself that probably froze in or something. Okay. All right, so let's do, let's do, let's do the, let's do the PowerPoint again. Okay. Yeah. So, um. Whilst Doc prepares to continue, I'd like to say that if you have any questions for Doc, kindly send them via the chat section here on Zoom. Or for those of you streaming on YouTube, you can type it under the comment section. At a point during this presentation, we would also um, open and then unmute a couple of you to ask a few questions directly. Okay to so okay so let me share again okay so let me share again i think okay all right so i've shared it now okay so so obviously if you start early it's better right so now this is an, another example the sooner you start the better but now think about this thing here the question of life insurance so most Ghanaians uh I would say do not have life insurance because they probably do not understand what a life insurance can do or what it does, right? So I'm gonna share a personal example for, with you. So uh, when I left Exxon, when I decided that I really wanted to get into something else where I can increase my earnings power and I left Exxon, there was a Ghanaian guy at, uh, in New Jersey who was selling life insurance for Prudential Life Insurance. And he came to me and he sold me a life insurance. That time, I just had no idea. I said, I'm a single guy. I'm not married and whatnot. He convinced me to buy, you know. Five years later, Prudential, the insurance company, became a public company. So it went through what they call demutualization, right? So it became a public company instead of a private mutual company, right? And as a result, I got a lot of shares because I had bought this huge amount of life insurance. I had no idea that that even could happen. That brought me a boatload of capital that allowed me to do other things that I would never have been able to do, right? Number one. Second, there was a life insurance that also I bought years ago 
And it got to a point, and few people actually really understand that life insurance, at some point, you can actually sell them to companies out there that buy life insurance. Don't be afraid. They're not going to come and kill you and <laughs> collect the life insurance. What it is, is that's a, a whole different business. But also think about it. If you have life insurance, especially in the case where you have children, you have house mortgage, and you have a lot of assets that you've invested in, that protection, is you cannot underestimate that, right? So be very, very cognizant of the whole rule that life insurance plays, right? Uh, the, it, we, I asked the question, what happens when you actually, something happens to you and you become disabled, right? Disability insurance are sold in Ghana also, right? Uh, and then thinking about how your money is going to go, if, if you were to die today, what happens? And the fact, at the, the, end of, the fact of the matter is that if you do not make a plan for your money and what will happen to your money, somebody will make a plan for what happens to your money when you're gone, right? Now, uh, let me actually go back and let's talk a bit about uh, really growing your assets, right? One of the things that has become obvious to a lot of people, if you're Ghanaian, you're on Facebook, you're on Instagram or whatever, you're seeing people making money, right? And you hear the stories. Now, think about even Game GameStop, right? Now, here's the thing. When GameStop first went up, a lot of people bought in, right? And then they started seeing it going up and going up and going up, going up. And then there were a lot of people talking about it on Facebook. Well, what happened if you're on Facebook and you felt like, okay, I needed to participate in this, it's scary and whatever. Well, of course, everything is scary. The folks who were able to be to, to were aggressive and were like the, against the gods people and jumped in, they made a boatload of money, right? So you were all seeing this. The guys at the top, the one of the best ways in this current world where people are building capital is equities, right? So whether you like it or not, the US is right now set up where growth is going to do this. And we're living in Ghana, right? And the question is this, how are we going to find exposure to that? Right, because that is an incredible opportunity for whatever reason, folks from Asia, from Europe, and whatnot have investment houses that are actually giving them exposure. So I can tell you, I have friends in Asia, Europe, even Denmark, who are all invested in the US markets because at home there are companies that are actually set up that allows that to happen. If you actually want to invest in the US equities market and take advantage of all the disruption, all these new companies that are coming out, Facebook that you've been using for so long and they're making money, if you want to participate in the upside, well, guess what? If you're in Ghana, you're not going to be able to because there hasn't been a setup where there's any company in Ghana that's allowed by the SEC in the US to actually bring investment here, right? So Obviously, that is an incredible space that, you know, but if you go to companies like Ecobank and you talk to them, they are able to do that for certain clients, right? So I would say this, that is an opportunity that I'm hoping even the guys behind, the, you know, invest in Ghana could actually figure it out and then we could actually make sure because there's been a lot of capital that has basically been built by people being exposed to US equities. The interesting thing is this US companies from Porsche to Postmark to uh, Instagram to Pinterest or whatnot, guess what? They're all global companies. They are chopping your money in Ghana. They're chopping people's money in Europe and whatnot. Apple is selling, Apple's revenue this quarter is $102 billion. That's like three times, uh, two times Ghana's uh, GDP. You know, and meanwhile, they said a whole boatload of, uh, uh, you know, phones in Ghana. So if you're sitting in Ghana, the thing is, this is the time to then figure out how do I actually get exposure, find some money, put it somewhere, find it and get the exposure to these US markets so that I can also build it. Because 
if you look at the pyramid, people have gone up because of global equities, because of global assets that they basically have been invested in. The folks at the bottom that are finding it difficult is because about 70% of the inequality gap is accounted for by just people who hold financial assets that have done better than people who don't hold financial assets, right? Uh, I've spoken a lot, so let me actually uh, open it up uh, so we can have uh, some questions and answer time, right? So Prince, I'm gonna turn it over to you and then we can, we can have some questions and stuff. Oh, okay. I, I was just about to um, alert you that you're spoken for an hour. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, all right. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, and that was a very great and insightful presentation. Um, I've learned a lot. Okay. In the past, uh, we we had a few questions coming in from okay. the audience. All right. Let, let's take the questions then. All right. Um, before I read out the questions, um, I'd like to say that for those of you streaming on YouTube, please do all to like and subscribe. Like the video and then subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you will be notified anytime we have a webinar just in case you forget to register for any of our webinars, at least when we go live, you will be notified so that you can join us. Okay, now um, straight to the questions. We have one from Kwabna that's asking, um, what would you say is the best commodity to invest in on our oh, stock okay. market? Okay, so when it comes to commodities, uh, when it comes to commodities right now, all the commodities actually have come down, right? Because of the disruption with the pandemic and whatnot. Gold is the only one who went up only because uh, the 10 year people, there was a flight to what I would call people being afraid of what will happen to their assets and whatnot, moved very much into US treasuries and gold and whatnot. And so that drove gold up. I will personally not advise you put money in gold because of the risk of actually getting uh, the US 10 year yield coming up and people finding other alternatives to put money in. But I would say uh, if you can actually get into commodities that are much more closer to the agri sort of, uh, you know, things like maize, corn, cocoa and whatnot, they've actually been quite depressed and when the whole recovery starts, you know, about say beginning of June, July and whatnot, you can actually see those uh, commodities coming up and whatnot, right? But, you know, I personally, if I'm in Ghana and I wanted exposure to commodities, something like cocoa and whatnot, right? I will really actually think seriously about creating a business in those commodities rather than just investing in them, you know, because it's, it's the, the, the investment, investing in them, they, vol, they move around too much, you know, and I think you can make some real good money if you actually identify one commodity that is also traded and then you actually become more of a producer in that, you know, unless you have okay. a lot of money to basically trade with. All right, and thank you very much, Doc. Um, we also have another question from Obibini. Bibini is asking, um, do you agree that the starting age should be earlier for Ghanaians? I mean, um, the working so, age. Oh, yeah, exactly. So right now, you know, the, the challenge in Ghana right now is this. And I've, ha I've had this fight with a lot of companies in Ghana. Uh, you know, they, 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 they have a, a lot of positions who open up. And a young guy who's about say 18 or 19 or 20 or 25 will apply. And then somehow they think he's too young, right? Uh, so that is a, a big, big challenge. But what I would say is that if, if, if you are done with, with high school, whether and you're in college or whatever, I would say, you know, do not, do not settle in a sense figure out how to start work somewhere doing something 
because the earlier you start, the better. I mean, it, to me, anyone who, is, who finishes uh, uh, SS should really, really be looking for a job of figuring out what to do to then make a living because the sooner you start, the better, right? Okay. Well, um, as a personal follow-up to that um, statement, you know, it's, it's a bit challenging for fresh graduates to enter the job market because nowadays you, you see job ads um, saying that they want people who have over three years or five years work experience just for an entry level role. It, it makes it very difficult for fresh out of school graduates to even get a little bit of experience from the job market. Right, right, and 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 this is where I, I I honestly would say that you know, Prince, I will encourage a lot of the young people to band together. Right, you know, I I never told you guys what Songai does, but one of the things that Songai did was last year and two years ago was actually restructured national service and introduced the whole concept of uh, entrepreneurship. Right. So right now, national service, yeah. if you are five people and you decide that you want to set up your own company and you just came out of school, you can go to national service and apply and basically apply for the entrepreneurship track and national service will pay you the stipend and then you guys could do the entrepreneurship that you guys wanted to do. It hasn't been broadcasted a lot. It hasn't been advertised a lot, but to me, it, you know, that's something that a lot of folks should just take advantage of because if five folks that are, you know, friends in school, you come out of uh, uni and you basically start a company, guess what? You register the company, you do the national service the one year, and that's one year of uh, basically figuring out an, a proper entrepreneurship that you guys are actually much more passionate about, right? And that, to yeah. me, could then be a much better work experience than going and getting a job at some some uh, company or some branch and then sitting there, you know, looking at some policeman all the time and then coming home without any experience, right? So that's something that to me, I always encourage young folks coming out of the uni that take advantage of that entrepreneurship angle and figure out something, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we have a lot of questions pouring in. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, Ni Adi is asking, what is your opinion on cryptocurrency investments? Ah, okay. So, so here's the thing about crypto, cryptocurrency. If you read the book, you know, Against the Gods, that I asked you guys to write, read, right? You'll notice that whenever there's any opportunity that people hear about in another land and whatnot, they got on the oceans and they basically bore the risk. And if they raise their fine, if they die, then they die, right? The thing to understand about cryptocurrency is this. Right now, a few people are making a boatload of money on it, right? So if you're going to actually get in, the, the, the asset itself is a non ending asset, meaning that it's not any asset that you can put give to someone and say, okay, if nothing happens, it makes money, right? If you give me a bond, there is a cash flow that someone is going to pay me at a certain point in the future. If you give me equities, there's a company behind it who sometime in future, they also will pay me money. If you give me a Bitcoin or Ethereum or some crypto, I'll sit there and basically there's no one is promising to give me any money, right? It's a non-ending asset. So I cannot get rich off it unless someone else believes in it to buy it from me at a higher price, which is fine. But that is the risk of getting on the ocean and going against the gods, right? So what I would say is this, if you think that somehow you can ride the waves and make some money, well then guess what? You should make sure it's not the money that you're not willing to lose. If you want to play in cryptocurrency, I would say, find a small amount of money and test it and understand it. And as you make it, you add it to your core, but never use your core, never bet the house on cryptocurrency. Because what happens is that there are few people who have actually managed to build it up 
And the, the way of, of, of investment banks and, and the place where I used to work and whatnot is this. We all love retail people getting into something because it makes it a market where we can, in a sense, control and make money, buy stuff and go in and out and out, right? If there's no market, the rich people don't get rich, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. frankly, Tesla, Elon Musk got rich because guess what? People have been willing to buy Tesla stock at a higher, higher, higher price, right? But at least there, you know that there's a company behind it. So I don't mind sort of people buying crypto, but what it is, is you have to understand that the volatility or the ocean that you're getting in can basically destroy you. So never really bet your core or your bank on it. Just find some small amount of money and use it as a way to basically hunt and add value here and there, here and there, right? Never make it your primary investment. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, I have a raised hand here. Um, the name Adubuatin. So, um, Adubuatin, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, name's um, Sequia. Thank you very much, Doctor, and thank you very much for um, putting this on um, investing Ghana. I wanted to just find out if, in terms of the diaspora, in terms of Songhai wealth, let's there's quite a lot of people in the diaspora, for instance, who have got liquid assets, so cash sitting in the banks. And as you said, just use banks for transactional basis, but the interest rates in the UK, for instance, is quite low. So if you've got something like less than 5,000, let's say in that bracket that you showed in your pyramid, let's just say you've got uh, money and not that in terms of wealth, they're in that bucket, but in terms of the um, liquid assets, they've got about, let's say less than 5,000 actually sitting there doing mm -hmm. basically nothing. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything at all that Songhai Wealth can offer that they can actually use this in Ghana. So somebody in a diaspora wanting to probably invest in Ghana or probably to build some sort of wealth as well in Ghana, but because they're away from the country, they want to do this at long length. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's actually a very good point. So if I were you, so with that level of money, one of the things that actually is opening up as an incredible opportunity now is actually if you look at the Ghana stock market right now, right? It is incredibly depressed. You know, companies like uh, Echo Bank, some of the financial companies are actually trading at one of their lowest points, right? So if, if, if to me, those are also the companies that can easily attract incredible amount of money from outside. So think about it. Companies like Echo Bank are, are establishing an incredible, incredible uh, you know, markets outside of Ghana where they're actually doing stuff outside of Ghana and tying up with banks like JP Morgan and whatnot and doing stuff inside Ghana. So if I had that level of amount of money and was just sitting there, I will actually just put it in the Ghana stock market by putting it in companies like Casa Preco, you know, Echo Bank, uh, uh, data bank and whatnot. I'm not a big fan of mutual fund. You know, I to me, mutual fund. You know, they, I took uh, my finance class from a guy called uh, Kenneth French, and Ken is one of the guys who came up with what they call the asset pricing theory, the uh, APT uh, theory in, in finance. And you know, the man looked at me one time and said, "Never buy a mutual fund." if you didn't learn anything from me in class. And that's because things like mutual funds, just, 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 just like your bank account, they will sit there and sit there and someone else will collect in fees from you. So if I had that amount of money, I will carefully actually uh, open a brokerage account in Ghana and go specifically into specific names like Echo Bank, uh, Casa Preco, companies that I know that actually few years from now, the expansion is still going to be happening. That's if I wanted to do something in Ghana. Hmm. Okay, um, thank you very much, Doc. Let me take another question from here. So Kofi Tando is asking, is, is there a life insurance offering in Ghana that is similar to that of the US? Uh... Uh, I'll say no. I'll say no. The life insurance products in Ghana, uh, 
you know, because there's so much, uh, I guess, happening in funerals, people have actually built more and more in funerals, right? The life insurance in Ghana doesn't really pay a lot. Uh, but uh, the, the US piece where you can cash in and whatnot, right now, there's nothing like that in Ghana, right? I mean, uh, I would say, you know, if you're young, <laughs> You, you didn't hear this from me, but if you're young, I would say figure out a way to travel and get get outside Ghana for a couple of years, few years and whatnot, and basically have exposure to some of the other products outside Ghana and then be able to go back and, you know, uh, do some, something else. But no, there, there isn't that same level of market and the type of products, no. Okay. Um... So I have a couple of people asking if the presentation will be made available. Others are also asking if the contact details of the speaker will be made available. And I'm yeah, happy no, so to the present, I'll, the Prince, I'll send you the presentation and then you can share, share it with everyone. But okay. and, and also, I'm, I mean, yeah. I'm on Facebook and you can send me, um, you know, you can send me WhatsApp or whatever. I mean, that's, that's fine. Okay, so we will send all that to um, our subscribers because that's the only way we can reach out to you. Okay, so so, so yes, if you yes. haven't subscribed or registered, please right. visit the Invest in GH website, www.investinggh.info. Click on register. It's a very short form. Your name and an email address we can reach you on, and then we will send you every information about Invest in GH. Also visit our YouTube channel, like and subscribe our videos, watch some of our previous webinars and get to know more about us. Okay, Doc, um, quick question from Sachs. Sachs mm -hmm. wants to know if there is an application like Robinhood or any other platform that we can use to trade um, stocks globally. So, uh... There is, you can use uh, Webull. Uh, let me put it in the chat. Sorry. Uh, we can use, so I'm putting it in the chat and then you can tell them Webull. You see, see that there's an app okay, called Webull. Yeah, there's an app called Webull. You can use Webull. Uh, there's another call called uh, Mumu, uh, M O O, M O O. You can also use Mumu, right, and set up an account there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So we have Weibo, and then I didn't quite get the other one. Uh, oh, Mumu. M O O M O O. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Doc. There yeah, is you can, another you can question actually here. go into the app store and then you'll find them there. Okay, sure, sure. Um, maybe we'll find time and then educate people on how to use these apps for their okay. transactions. Okay. So okay. that's something we'll consider. So um, those of you who, who are not able to get in touch with us, we have WhatsApp and Telegram and Signal groups that you can join and then get interactive with us anytime. So please, you will find the links to these groups on our website, www.investingh.info. So kindly visit the website so that you can get in touch with us. All right. And Doc, this one is coming from mm -hmm. Nenyi. Nenyi is asking, what are your suggestions on how Ghanaian-based workers can increase their earning power? in order for them to be able to invest more? Oh, okay, all right. That's a very, very good question. Uh, you know, one of the things that I would say is this, and I've always told a lot of the guys that I, I, I mentor that, you know, uh, no one will, is, will, will be willing to sign a very big check for you unless they really like you, right? Uh, so when you're in Ghana and you just came out of uni and you're thinking about how do I increase my earnings power, right? One of the big thing is this, really finding, uh, let me put these three options. If, if I mean somebody who was just coming out of uni, number one, I'll figure out 
a way to actually get exposure from outside and come back in and be able to, in a sense, increase my earning power with that whole outside experience, right? Now, I realize that a lot of people will go and get degrees. The problem with getting degrees and trying to increase your earnings power with degrees is that you can only go into jobs where people think that degree is what they want, right? And they'll just pay you because of that degree. They won't pay you because somehow you need to be paid more to be kept, right? So to me, figuring out a way to just say, okay, you know, let me just get out and come back in is one approach. The second piece is finding a sponsor, right? And this is where I will actually say the, the circles that you begin to move in becomes very, very critical. You find somebody who you believe probably, uh, you know, has done it, has, you know, is, is much more higher up in the whatever, and you became very, very much, uh, you, you ask them to become your sponsor and they teach you the rope and they basically figure it out for you. And then the third piece is, listen, if you want to increase your earnings power in, in Ghana, if you are able to figure out with a group of friends your own business, chances are you'll be much more successful than going to work for a government or another company. Unless somehow, uh, I mean, there are people who work for government or other companies and they, they're happy to take bribes and they, they, they increase your earnings power by just basically being guys who would love to take bribes, right? But to me, the whole idea of working for yourself is a third option and that you can actually figure out a lot because you begin to work for yourself and you begin to make some cash, then you can actually do things, right? Even buying a, a, a teaming up with a group of guys and buying uh, some apartments and doing Airbnb as a business or even doing uh, Uber as a business and whatnot, but more organized fashion, you know? So... Number one, figure out a way to just come out and get exposure, which uh, three of the guys that I mentor, you know, uh, from Ashasi, they've been able to do that, right? Uh, they've been in the U.S. for a while. You know, uh, one of them just came back and got married. So that is a very, very uh, solid option. And then the second one, just finding a sponsor. And the third one, you know, go the route of basically start, starting a business with a group of friends, you know, uh, Okay, Doc, um, thank you very much for your response. Augustine is asking, can you please elaborate on the gold trading issue you talked about? The, the, uh, with, what was the question again? He's asking if you can elaborate on the gold trading issue you talked about during your presentation. Oh, okay. So, so what I was saying is that, you know, uh, a lot of so a lot of people uh, somehow think they can make a lot of money off gold, right? Which is fine if you actually set up a business in gold and you you know you find a way to get into the whole gallum thing and somehow uh, you're okay with the sustainability and whatnot and you can make a lot of money then. But it, as an investment vehicle, gold at one point was very very attractive. Right now, gold is basically at a at, at a peak because of the U.S. ten year uh, uh, treasury uh, uh, rates because people have piled in because of the pandemic and fear and risk and whatnot have driven gold prices down. The rest of commodities have not done very well. So if you're very attracted to gold, I will actually say uh, in terms of buying gold to be exposed to the high prices, there's going to be a reversal. And so for the next five to six 10 years, it's not really an asset that you want to have. What it is, is if you want to build right now on what you have and you're a young person, I would rather suggest you use whatever money you go into gold with and actually direct them to equities. Now, you can actually buy equities, which is gold companies who actually do very well and their prices are down, right? So I, that's, that's what I, I, I would say. I would not uh, look at gold right now as the place to build my wealth and capital and whatnot. You can, you, if you have any money to put to work, it will be better spent in the equities market on either gold equities or uh, royal com royalty companies and things like that, but not, not really buying gold as an investment. 
Okay, and um, thank you very much. There, um, okay, so this one is asking, can someone in Ghana be able to invest in the 10 year treasury notes in the US? And how is that possible? Uh, okay, so 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 basically, if you want to invest in in the treasuries in the U.S., you actually have to do it through uh, uh, some of the banks in Ghana, uh, but not direct. Uh, uh, direct, basically, you would need uh, uh, you, you basically need to go through a U.S. brokerage to do that one. So not not direct. But what I was saying is that it's something that you should keep an eye on because it drives a lot what goes on around the world, right? So, uh, you know, when the U.S. 10-year treasury starts moving from China to Europe to Africa and whatnot, currencies and stuff start moving. So it's a way to basically educate yourself about, you know, the economic cycles in the world and how it's, it's, it's kind of working. Okay. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, Daniel is asking, is it wrong to convert dollars and to invest in CDs? Well, uh, if you invest in it, so basically what you want, what Daniel is saying that if you have dollars, uh, is it okay to put, convert it to CDs? And basically, you know, the question is, if it's savings that you're trying to uh, keep, why do you want to put it in CDs? Because there's nothing really uh that's helping this structurally the city is is struggling right it's very difficult for the city to perform because the country has quite a, a bit of debt there's huge structural imbalance in terms of how much we import into the country we actually spend a lot more in dollars than in cities in terms of the country itself you know and what it imports and exports so uh if you did that two years, five years from now, you know, if the city goes up to 10, you've only lost money. It's not good. You, 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 you basically, you're, you're destroying uh, your capital, right? So if you can put it in, in dollars, I would say you, you keep it in dollars and you find a way to invest it in dollars uh, till when you need to use it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Israela. Israela is asking, um, I wish to find your views on online investments such as Patreon pay, cryptocurrencies, forex trading, and the like. Um, she has heard they are risky. What do you advise? So, 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 so let me put it. So let me put it this way. What 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 people don't know about is that you know, in investment banking, uh, in our trading operations. Everything that any retail person can trade in or can basically on, do online investing in is usually uh, assigned to a desk. So if you want to invest in Apple, if you want to invest in uh, Forex and whatnot, inside every investment bank, there are trading desks that are actually dedicated in actually also trading. And so those are the people that you're trading against. And every trading desk has uh, a research person, a strategy person, a risk person, a quant, and then the trader. So it's usually a team of about five to seven people trading assets. And those are the assets that you also every day are trading in. So if you go and you buy something and you actually are looking to just hold it for a while and then at the right time sell it, then that is fine. But if you want to be an online sort of uh, day trader, then those are the desk that you're going up against. They actually have much more insight. And you as a retail person, you know, they can trade faster than you. They can actually put more of a uh, computerized trading on and not be there and you actually lose a lot of money. So it's quite risky. So in that sense, I always advise people, it's better if you're trying to actually build wealth because we are not trying to uh, run a casino, right? Then you take your time, you understand the market. This is the whole point of actually being an avid reader in terms of financial markets and the assets that you're interested in and understand it more and then invest 
you know, where you actually take your time and you set a target for your return before you get out, right? Uh, yeah. Anything that I have invested in, the moment they rate 40% return, I'm out, right? It doesn't matter whether I like it or I don't like it. It's not, I mean, I don't invest because I like the companies. I invest because of what they can generate. And once I get what they can generate, I'm out, right? I'm trying to build wealth. And that's what, to me, I think people should think about, right? Uh, you, yeah. If you don't have a return target, then every time you sit around and then you lose money all the time, right? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Michael is asking, how do I get exposure to the US stock market in terms of equities? Oh, okay, so so uh, where's my Michael is based in Ghana? Um, I don't know. Okay, so whatever Michael is based in, so if he uses the Weibo or the Moomoo app, then he can basically start learning about the US uh, market quite a bit. I mean, it covers the US, Asia, and whatnot, but US piece. And then if he opens account on there, then he can basically start sort of getting a sense of, you know, uh, what is going on, right? But uh, what I would say is this, if you want to get access to the US, uh, the exposure to the US market, one of the best ways is if you like a company, go to the company's website, look at the investor, uh, investor uh, session, and then find out when the company is going to do an earnings call, right? And then yeah. dial into that earnings call and just listen to what happens. And because that's, those are the best ways to learn about the companies, right? And if they do have any presentations on their website, then really dig into it and whatnot, right? But as far as the general education about the US stock market, what I can do is that I can pull some reports together and share with you, Prince, your group, and then you can distribute it to people so they can sort of at least read more broadly how the market is organized and things like that, and how you start with an account and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay, okay, sure. Um, Pepra is asking, how do you open a bank account in dollars? And how do you get the bank to invest your dollars for you okay. in Ghana? Yeah. Right, okay, so, so, so in Ghana, to actually open a bank account in dollars, you actually will have to go into the account, go into the banks and actually have a discussion with them because what it is is that it's not something that uh, usually is, is common, right? So what uh, I would say is that uh, places like Fidelity Bank, uh, Echo Bank, you can actually walk in and get it done, right? But it's not something that's common. So usually you will not be able to do it at a branch. You usually will have to go to the headquarters. You know, so uh, either with, with Fidelity, you go to trust the place where their the main headquarters near, uh, uh, what do you call it, City House, uh, and then uh, uh, Echo Bank, opposite uh, Fort Sutherland Park, you know, you go there, you know, but it has to be at the head. You can't do it at a branch. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question is coming from Linda. <clears throat> Linda is asking, are we better of exposing ourselves to the American capital market rather than our local boss that has been on the losing spree for the past seven years? Uh, I'll say yes. Yes. If you can find a way to have exposure to the U.S. Uh, equities market, uh, if, uh, I'll say that you would do much, much better. Okay. All right. Um, Kwesi is asking, Oak talks about how to invest in the U.S. markets or the S&P 500 um, with Ecobank. Can he elaborate more on how that can be possible? Oh, okay. So, so that, that, that actually is possible if you actually uh, uh, do a private client account with them, right? So in a sense, it's not something that is... Uh, uh, basically, you have to be a cli private client uh, customer. What I was actually trying to, I think I really want to encourage the investing GH people to do, and I've had this discussion with them before, is if they are willing, then I can help them actually create a platform 
But one of the ways you can actually do it now, if you go on Weibo or Mumu, you can actually open an account and fund it you know, from, from Ghana uh, and basically be able to buy the S&P 500 on Weibo and Mumu, but it will be outside of Ghana. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Albert has a few questions. The first one is what opportunities can emerge for equity markets in Ghana? And then how do we boost <clears throat> investor confidence on the Ghanaian markets? Okay, so 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 to me, I think I think one of the things on the Ghanaian market that uh, I will encourage the young people to do is this: one of the big hurdles is you know to buy a stock or to buy a government bond in Ghana is such a pain. I mean, if you buy treasuries or you buy government bond. You have to complete a, a paperwork, and then the paperwork goes to the bank, and then the bank sends it to uh, BOG, and then BOG will give you the dates when they will pay you uh, interest, and then it comes back to the bank, and the bank sends you says now you we have your you know that 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 whole process needs to be just cut down, right? Uh, I mean, it, we have to get to a point where you can just take an app and say, okay, here's the company on the stock exchange, you know, uh, a crab brewery or whatever and buy it, right? And open an account. So that's what, because we are not there, every time that you look at the stock market, it feels like there's not a lot of participation, right? And to me, it's, it's up to a lot of the young guys to basically figure out the, the technology and basically create a platform and, and, and basically they disrupt the banks and tell the banks, okay, because you, you don't need a bank to buy a stock on the Ghana Stock Exchange, right? So why do you always have to go to a bank and go to some brokerage, right? I mean, it's all listed. You should be able to buy it and basically go through the whole settling and everything, right? Why do I have to, if I buy a bond, do I have to wait for some forms to be filled and whatnot when I, everybody knows that I'm like, I'm, 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 my bank account is this and this, you know, it's just too much. And that's because you need a lot of uh, technology to come in and basically disrupt the whole thing and it hasn't happened. And that, that makes it very hard to actually be very confident in it. So, because people are not uh, sure whether it's being manipulated or because you're, when you're there, the price jumps and then all of a sudden the price comes down and you're like, what the heck happened? You know, <laughs> no news. And then one stock is just dropped, you know, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. Right. So, uh, I think it needs to be a bit more transparent and especially a lot of young people have to bring in technology, much like Robin Hood and whatnot has happened in the US and other places also have their own versions. You know, I mean, Weibo was created by a non-US guy and it's, it's working very well, you know, so. Okay, thank you very much. And um, there's a question asking, are there any tax obligations for Ghanaians who would want to trade US stocks or equities? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, so every time you 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 basically sell it, you'll be responsible for the taxes. So that that is just obvious. But it's not it's capital gains, it's not as you know, as it's not as onerous as you'll be taxed in Ghana, right? So that's just yeah. So to me, when it comes to taxes and sort of investing and trading, all you have to do is you have to plan it ahead, right? If you want 5%, then you plan it such that you make 10% and you pay whatever, right? Uh, if you're yeah. trying to create wealth, taxes should not be the reason. People who actually try to minimize taxes, it's not wealth that they are trying to create. What it is, is they're trying to protect the little that they have. That's what it is, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think our questions are reducing now. Okay. If I haven't asked your question, you can raise your hand so that I call you briefly and then I'll mute you so you can ask your question. All right. Um, some of these questions. <laughs> so, Frederick, I can't. Okay, so, Frederick. 
Frederick, are you there? Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Frederick, we can hear you. Yeah, hi, Frederick. Yeah, thank you for the uh, insightful presentation. I think I did ask a question, but obviously a lot of people are asking questions, so I'm sure um, they may have skipped mine. Because I wanted to know your thoughts about the Ghana, uh, the Ghana Stock Exchange. And I think you did touch on some of them where you talk about the fact that most of the stocks are depressed at the moment. And right. I've done a bit of research on them before, but you see that that depression or the slow or, or the non-trend, if you want to put, put it that way, seems to be there for some of them for over 10 years. And like you did say, you don't hear any news. And then at some point they tell you that one of the stock is delisting. And I'm just thinking from a wealth point of view, someone who wants to invest long-term 10, 15 years, because obviously you don't have the time to be checking these things every day or every hour. Would you really advise uh, investing in the Ghanaian stock uh, market, given these rigidities and then the flattening of most of the stocks? Yeah, so I would not advise investing in the index, right? But what okay. it is, is I'll actually more do it by a, a, a case by case basis. So for example, you know, there are companies on there that have international exposure in terms of the business that they do, right? Mm. It's not localized. Those companies, to me, they, they, are, they, are, they are good to invest in because they can even be acquired by another company from outside, right? Okay. Uh, but if, you, if you're thinking, so if, the reason why I say a company like Casa Preco or, or, uh, or even Echo Bank is that, I, Casa Preco actually is trying to expand outside Ghana. And Casa Preco is actually a company who in the past had gotten solicitation to be bought by another uh, big brand from outside, mm -hmm. right? So companies like that, to me, are, are much better than the ones that are just hanging around, right? But if I, if I personally, if I had money and I'm actually younger than uh, 40 years old, Mm. then I will find a way to be much more exposed to the outside rather than the inside because okay. of the double effect that if I just let myself stay inside the city and then the, the low earning access will kill me. Mm. Right? So to me, it's better at that. If you're below 40, to me, just find a way to be exposed outside Ghana to the international markets, right? Because that's where you can then basically see a wealth growth where it, whenever you decide to bring it home, it, it sort of makes sense. I mean, it's really incredible. I mean, recently, uh, you know, I wanted to buy a car uh, and, you know, I went to a, a BMW dealership in Ghana and they, they gave me a package. They're like, okay, uh, BMW 500 series, 538i, whatever, um, you know, and, and the guy gives me the thing and it's like $75,000, right? So I look mm -hmm. at it, I said, huh, okay, $75,000. I said, man, so you guys sell these cars. And how many people in Ghana are buying these cars right here? And he says, dog, well, a lot of people buy it here, here, but it doesn't move as fast and whatnot. So long story short, I come to the U.S., and I take the same specs car and I go to a car dealership here and I said, what do you think? And he goes, oh, $35,000. So that is twice as much. You know, $35,000, it would have been sold to me for $70 in Ghana. You know, so I, I bought the car and it cost me $9,000 to ship and I ship it to Ghana, right? So... 35 plus nine is way less than 75. So if you can think about me, if I had not come out over the course of my life, if that's how I'm spending my money in Ghana, then I'm destroying my wealth. I'm basically destroying the every earnings power that I have is being eaten into by all these high priced items and stuff like that, right? And it's the same way with investments, right? So if you actually... Uh, less than 40 years old and you find yourself and get more exposure to outside, you're going to have higher returns that you can bring home instead of staying home and then 50 years, then you're wondering, oh, you bought this and how come it hasn't moved and whatnot, you know, because there's no, so, so to me, uh, if I'm below 40, I'll, I'll, I'll find a way to find much more exposure. If I have to do it in Ghana, then I'll be very, very specific 
to the companies that actually have international exposures or doing something outside the country and bringing in money from outside the country, right? Okay, thank you very much, Doc. Um, we have Pauline. Pauline, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, can hear you. Just two more questions. Uh, Paul, Pauline so, Adaman. Uh, yes. Pauline. Yes, this is me. Well, yeah, um, yes. So um, my question is, I'd like to know the pros and cons of um, keeping a dollar account in Ghana. What are the pros and cons? Well, uh, the, the, uh, well the pros is, is basically, it's much more stable in the sense that, you know, you keep it, if it's $200, uh, three, five years from now, you can be rest assured it's $200. Right. And, you know, it probably will buy you more because the city usually goes in one direction against the dollar. Right. It becomes cheaper and cheaper for you to buy stuff in Ghana if you keep it in dollars. Right. Uh, now, the, the cons is, 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 is basically you, you, it, it's, it's not as easily accessible like you will have in cities. Right. So to me, that is that is nothing. Right. Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. If you come by a lot of money and you feel like, okay, I have a bank account and I have uh, 50,000 CDs sitting in there, you know, that 50,000 CDs, if you're thinking of doing something with it right away, then of course you use it right away. But if you're thinking, okay, what do I do with that 50,000 CDs that I haven't really decided? Well, guess what? Then, you know, find a way to get it into a different currency so that a year, two years later, when you're ready to do something with it, it has not, you know, messed up because you can't, you know, you cannot go and buy something. I'm not, I mean, one of the things you could do is you can buy treasury bills, right? But again, the risk is when you get your treasury bills and the city is going in one direction, you know, a year from now, you get paid interest rate and it's small. It's not, it's not as what you, you thought it would be. So to me, it's, it's just a way to basically... Uh, if you're not ready to use the money, you have it kept, kept somewhere where it's a bit more stable. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, okay. Pauline. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, Godwin is asking, what's your advice if someone wants to invest in real estate companies? So, is this, so real estate companies in Ghana or real estate companies outside? Um, he mentioned a company like Cardon Capital. So this is in Ghana then. Okay. So, 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 um, you know, if you're going to invest in real estate as an investment in Ghana, uh, to me, Ghana doesn't have a very liquid real estate market, meaning that it's not easy to just buy a home and then turn around and sell that home, right? Now, there are companies that are coming up right now that are basically setting up these, what you call the hotel sort of uh, type where you buy the, the property and they, they rent it out to get revenues for you and all that kind of stuff. If you can actually get exposure to that or invest in those types of uh, uh, real estate, then that's fine because someone is actually promising to take your money and pay you and the property is actually there. Other than that, uh, I would, if I had money to actually invest, I would actually put it in, in assets. If I bought a real estate and wanted to do something like uh, Airbnb and whatnot, I will prefer that than actually giving it to a company that's doing its own Airbnb and you're part of it, unless the amount of money is not that big for you, right? But Companies that are doing the hotel setup where you buy the property, you own a piece of the property and they're using it to generate. And, uh, you know, that that's fine. I don't know about, uh, I mean, Kadoma, I don't know what they do. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I've, I've never really delved into it to see their business model. So I won't be able to advise on that. But I would say real estate in general, it's not very liquid in Ghana. So if I would not, get into buying real estate to sell because you can buy it and then sit on it and then you won't find a buyer. But however, if you want to do things like um, Airbnb or join some of the uh, 
companies that actually do that Airbnb hotel format and pay you a fee, then that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I'm taking the last question. Beautiful. For the evening. Okay. All right. Bernard is asking, what's your take on short selling and options trading? Oh, okay. So, uh, so I'm not a big fan of short selling uh, because, you know, to me, if you find a company and the company is not doing well, right, and it's horrible company, uh, you just move on, right? There are some folks who basically want to short sell, but the guys, the hedge funds that do the short sell, the reason why they do it is because they also have platforms where they can promote the bad story in order to achieve the, to kind of talk the stock down. Uh, when it comes to options trading, you know, I, 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 I traded options at uh, Deutsche Bank. I would say for the individual, uh, if you're interested in doing options trading, I will not use your core money in the sense that if you're trying to build capital, uh, I will not use my core money to do options trading. The times that you, because what people don't understand is that when you buy options, it's very straightforward, whether you buy calls and puts and whatnot. What people don't recognize that the problem is when your stock price is around the strike and you begin to have very high volatility. That is the piece that usually the systems that you're using, they may not be enough tools for you to actually control what happens, right? And you end up getting into trouble. So I personally, I, I don't, I, I, I don't need to, you don't need to get into stock options to make money, right? Because if you're trying to build long-term capital, just find very good solid investments that actually do well over time and you can sleep at night. Otherwise, you, you know, every time you, you put on options and whatnot and you sleep and you wake up, you're wondering what, where the market will open and then your heart is always going blah, 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 blah. Right? So I personally think uh, the best way to build long-term wealth is just find good investments to put your money in. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Doc. Um, unfortunately, time will not permit us to respond to any more questions yeah so 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 thank, thanks a lot for everyone uh th this is uh i see a lot of names a lot of young people uh yeah. you know, it's, it's just amazing the number of uh young people in ghana and all the uh uh the excitement and the brain power and the capacity to just change things you know and i, I some of these questions that you guys have asked they are questions that basically i think a few of you actually have to also get on the side of creating businesses and platforms to make it uh, much more vibrant in Ghana. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Um, before we conclude, just a few announcements. You can get the recording of this webinar and play it back on our YouTube channel, Invest in GH. Whilst you do that, kindly like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have other videos as well, previous webinars that we've held on topics in real estate investments, stocks, bonds, and we've also discussed cryptocurrencies. So if you have any questions regarding any of these topics, kindly visit the Invest in GH YouTube page and then watch these videos. And get, I'm sure you'll get your questions answered. If you still have any further questions after these, you can still get to reach us on our WhatsApp groups, or you can call us. We have our phone lines available. Just visit our website, www.investingh.info, and then get in touch with us. We'd like to thank you all for coming today. We are grateful, and we hope to see you next time we organize a webinar. Like I said, the presentation will be made available to all of you um, participants who are here. If you don't have our contacts or you are not a part of any of our WhatsApp groups, just visit the website and then click the link there to join. You can also give us a call or send us a WhatsApp message. Our contacts are available on the website. And then 
reach us so that we can send these documents to you. Okay, so that's yeah. it, Doc. Yeah. Thank you very much. We appreciate your presence. Oh, thank you very much. Thank, a lot. You. thank you. And thank you so hope... much for being with me uh, this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> or oh, this evening over in Ghana, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. it's evening in Ghana. Okay, yeah. beautiful. Thanks so a lot. Thank friend. you. Okay, all right. We will see you next time. Have a good evening.